we have moved on from our series at the moment, at least of uh, in the midst of crisis. And yet, in some ways, this the, this morning's sermon, I guess you could say, ties back to it a little bit. In that we're going to be looking at, at one of our New Testament stories and, and talking about finding a place to belong. And you'll hopefully understand what I mean by that a little bit more as we move further into this. But but as we talk about a, a place to belong, we need to remember uh, as we're setting this up that it's not just a place for you but a place that we're supposed to be helping others to come and find a place to belong. So as we, we dive into this this morning, and as we strive to move forward in our service to God, there, there are a couple things that I think have to take place in our lives. And, uh, and I'm not saying that maybe this doesn't already apply to some of us or most of us, um, but there's probably room for improvement. And that is that we've got to find that place where we feel like we belong. Uh, and by that, I'm not just talking about what we see happen a lot of times where where people bounce from church to church to church and and just oh, well, I'm just looking for that place that just feels like it's the perfect fit. Uh, the truth is, nowhere is ever feels like just the absolute perfect fit. There are places that feel really good, there are places that feel better than others. But until we start doing some of the things that I want to talk to us about this morning, we're not going to find it feeling that perfect fit because we're not in that place yet. We're just sort of passing through it. And hopefully that'll, that'll become clear what I mean by that in a moment. Second is, not only do we need to be able to be feeling in place or feel like where we go is that place, but it needs to be a place that we help develop to be that place that others, we want to encourage them to come feel like it's home. The story that we are going to begin with this morning is in, if my technology will cooperate with me, in and we're going to be looking at verses 46 through 48. And as we read that story, uh, we're, we're going to see here a, a group of people that were just there. So re read with me, Mark chapter 10, beginning verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, this is Jesus and his disciples. It says, and as they, they came together with a large crowd, they were leaving the city, and a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, as we read just that, that initial part of this text, does that sound like a crowd that's happy to be together? Not necessarily. There's, they're a different agenda. They're there for different purposes. Uh, the, the blind man is initially there to beg, to try to take advantage of the crowd gathering for whatever reason. Uh, different ones in the crowd. Some of them are there because they want to see Jesus, because they've heard the stories about him, and, and they, they want to see and see for themselves. Others are there because maybe they're 
They don't like Jesus. They, they've heard the stories and they, they stand opposed to him. They're, they're looking for the way maybe to trap him or to, to cause him problems. <coughs> and so we, we see a crowd that finds themselves probably not all that happy to be together. Here, Bartimaeus hears Jesus is coming. He's heard about Jesus. And, and so he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody else around him said, shut up, you idiot. <laughs> this guy, he, he can't help you. He's not going to help you. He's, you know, why are you making all this noise? We can't hear for what you're shouting. You know, all those different things being thrown at him. Not a place that would make you feel like you were at home. Not a place that would make you feel like, hey, here's a group of people that are all waiting on Jesus. You know, we would at least like to think we had some commonality in that, but it shows that they don't. And so with this story, it focuses in on the individual, Bartimaeus, blind man, beggar. He, he didn't fit in with the crowd to begin with because of those disabilities. And by calling out for Jesus, he begins to show even more difference between himself and part of the crowd. <clears throat> and yet, if we were to have the story told of all the individuals that were there, we would find they all have flaws. They all have sins. They all have backstories. They all have struggles. Some of them might have been very obvious. Everyone who saw the blind man knew what he was. Others may have, may have had struggles. They may have been individuals that they knew about the storms that were going on in their lives. And, and so when they looked at them, they knew who they were and what they were about. And yet there were others that were probably like some of us here this morning. That when they looked at them, they had no idea about the storm in their life. They were in one, but nobody knew about it. The kids. And so we again we we start off seeing this group that very much needs Jesus. They all have the same need, they all have the same what should be goal and desire to meet him, and yet we see these different responses. We see the struggle within the dynamic of the group. And one of the problems that I, I think is part of this is the fact that they were waiting on Jesus. Our role with Jesus is not to be a passive. Now, we, we use the terminology waiting on Jesus a lot, and, and there, it's not totally inaccurate, it's not totally inappropriate to, to use that terminology, but our waiting on Jesus is not supposed to be passive. It, it, these individuals could have taken the initiative, they could have gone to search for Jesus. They could have done like the rest of the crowd had done. They could have sought him out and been there to be a part of this, but instead they've chosen their, their waiting for him to arrive at their town. If he comes, we'll see him. If he doesn't, well, we just missed that. Um, and, and it was an individual thing. Our lives were not designed to be spent sitting on the side of the road in the midst of a people who are sitting and waiting and doing nothing. That's a long, probably according to the English teacher, run on sentence. But God didn't design us, he didn't create us to sit 
and do nothing. He, he didn't design us to, and, and put eternity in our hearts for us to sit back in the middle of a crowd that's waiting just to see what's going to happen. Scripture says he created us to do good works. To be active. To, to be a part of the process. And as Jesus and his disciples were arriving towards this crowd, there was a crowd that was following Jesus because they followed him everywhere he went. They had seen the miracles. They, they wanted to be there. They wanted to be active. They wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to know more about what he was teaching. They wanted to ask questions. They wanted to, to, to be in the midst of where Jesus was. In the midst of all that was happening. God designed us to be social. He designed us to be a part of that type of a group. A, a group that is designed to help each other and not to tear each other down. There shouldn't be any other, hey, shut up, idiot. <laughs> yeah. Not even a nicer version of that amongst us. It's you're praising God. You're praising Jesus. Let me praise with you. You're praying and asking for something from God, from Jesus. Let me pray with you. And the, the group, there's supposed to be a different dynamic to the group so that we don't have to be individuals in that. Bartimaeus knew that he needed more than what the group he was in was all. They could give him the alms. They could, could provide something for him financially as he was begging, even if it was reluctantly. <coughs> but they could never give him what he really needed. They could never give him his sight back. They couldn't even give him the other aspect or would not give him the other aspect, and that was the fellowship and the companionship of being an equal. Because he was blind. Bartimaeus heard Jesus was coming. And he said, I, I've got this choice. I can either stay here as a part of this crowd that's just waiting and watching to see what's going to happen, or I can get active. I haven't been active before this moment, but I can be active now. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Let, let me interact with you. Let me get your attention. Let me see what you will do for me. Because I've heard you're the only hope that I've got. When we're a part of the crowd that's waiting on Jesus, when, when we're a part of this world, we're not all waiting on Jesus for the same reasons, the same expectations. Some are waiting to oppose. Some are waiting to try and destroy. Others are waiting for healing. Some don't know what they're waiting for. They just say, well, everybody's here. This must be the place to be. It, it feels like I'm supposed to be here. It feels like this is the place to belong. Until you find out that you don't agree with the crowd. Well, the crowd doesn't agree with you. Bartimaeus was going to make sure that he didn't stay a part of a do-nothing-but-wait crowd. And so he began to call out for Jesus. And when they challenged him, when they told him to be quiet, what does he do? Verse 49. Jesus stopped and said to him, call him. And so they call the blind man, spear up, on your feet. He's calling you. Because when they told him to be quiet, he called out even louder. And then verse 50 says, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet, 
And he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight. And did what? And followed Jesus along the way. Those passages there tell us the response that Bartimaeus had. Jesus stops. He says, come here. Come talk to me. I've heard your plea. I've heard your cry. What mercy do you want from me? It says he throws his cloak aside. And we think, well, why in the world would you throw your cloak aside? You might want that later. In this case, the cloak was the symbol of who he had been. I'm sure it wasn't his cleanest. I'm sure it wasn't his best dressed cloak. May have owned one. But you don't go out to bed wearing your very best, do you? If you're going out to beg alms because you're blind, you want to make sure that you look the part to draw sympathy. The, the, the cloak that he was wearing was a symbol for all who saw him that here's somebody that needs pity, somebody that needs help, somebody that's different from us. And as he heard Jesus respond to his call, he throws that cloak aside because there is a confidence those days are over. Jesus is about to do something. And if he doesn't, I guess I could go pick it back up. But there was a confidence that he was about to be healed, that he was about to find his place and his purpose, <coughs> that he was about to find a place where he could truly belong to something greater. And so he ends up face to face with Jesus. Jesus asks him, what is it that you want me to do? And he has a very clear, a very distinct answer. I want see. I've heard the stories of what Jesus did. I've heard of the lame walking. I've heard of the lepers being healed. I've heard of other blind being made to be able to see. I don't want to be able to see. Now I point this out because today as we are waiting on Jesus, and we find ourselves in, in one of these two crowds. Either we're part of this crowd that's sitting there waiting, watching to see what's going to happen, or we're part of those that are following Jesus that have found our place where we belong, find a place that we can begin to heal. But the reality is we've all got something to heal. We, we've all got something that we're trying to bring to Jesus. And he's saying, what is it that I can do for you? And we need to be prepared with our answer for him. For Bartimaeus, it was, I want my sight. For us, it may be some answer totally different. For us, it might be, God, this is the addiction that I'm dealing with. God, this is the habit I've developed that I need to kick. God, this is the thing that's hurting my heart. Father, this is the relationship that's gone sour that, that, I haven't spoke to this family member because of, and, and I, I need to find a way to heal that. Father, here's where I'm at, what's keeping me from feeling apart. And I need to heal. 
We all have the sins that we need to have wiped away, that we need to have healed when we come to Jesus. But the reality is we've got these other parts of our lives that are broken, that we need to be ready to say, Jesus, this is what I need to heal in. This is where I need strengthened. This is where I need comforted. This is where I need guidance. And I know you're the answer. And when we are able to come to him in that way, just as we saw in our, our lesson last week, those the, the prayers, fervent prayers of a righteous person avail much. When, when we can come to Jesus in that way, we can get the same answer Bartimaeus got. Your faith has healed you. Now, it, it might not happen as instantaneously as Bartimaeus, where Jesus says that the instantly he can see. It, it may still take a little bit more time for the comfort to totally take place in my heart, to, to get me totally past this moment. It, it may take time still to heal a relationship. It, it may still take a little longer for God to help me kick the addiction. Now, if there's times where it gets, God's able to take it away like that. Praise God when he does. Well, there's times where it takes a little longer. But as we've talked about in other recent lessons, God has his means for every storm that we walk through. His timing for how he, he brings us through those things. <coughs> and so, like Bartimaeus, we need to end up face to face with Jesus. We need to get that personal healing that he has so that then we can end up within the group we're not just waiting for Jesus, but those who have been touched by Jesus. Those who have been healed by him, called by him, changed by him. And who, even though Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you, Bartimaeus said, Bartimaeus said my faith may have healed me, but I'm not going. Follow. Staying with you. The reality is, both groups still exist today. There are still those on the sidelines who are waiting to see if Jesus will come back. There are some who are waiting to, to see him, who want to join him when he comes by, but they're passively waiting. Waiting for some big moment to happen that, that is the sign for them that Jesus is really there or in front of them. Some are waiting to see and hoping to be able to say that the rest of us were wrong, that we were wrong to believe, that we were wrong to hope. Some are just lost, not sure where or how to find their way out of the crowd. Then there are those who are following Jesus. Those who must make sure that we are not passively following, but actively following. Those who are acting as the body of Christ, who are reaching out and calling to those who are seeking him and helping them find the place of healing that is in Jesus. Finding the place to belong. And as we think about finding ourselves in that group, I want to repeat something that I uh, mentioned in Bible class this morning. God brought each of us here for a purpose. He brought us here to be part of that group. And he brought us to this group And there may be a season of healing that we are in when we first get here. That God has brought us for this group to help with that healing. 
But I want you to know and I want you to be confident that that if you're going to be a part of that group, God's intention is that you're not here for a lifetime season of healing. And by that I mean to sit back and to be served. Healing. But to arrive at a point where you also begin to serve. Where you also begin to help others in their healing. So that, that we're active as a group together. And, and I feel like that didn't come out quite as good as I intended for it to come out uh, the way I'm trying to say it with what I'm trying to mean. But we have moments where, yes, the focus has to be on us and our healing. And we'll have different ones of those moments at different times. But there's got to be something more to our relationship with Jesus and more with our relationship with the group than only being served to be healed. He brought us here to be active. He brought us here to help serve others. He brought us here so that together we are the healed body. active and alive and becoming that place where we truly do feel like we purpose. But until we get to that point where we're actively involved in that work, we'll never be to that place where it truly feels perfect. Because God designed us to be a part of the group. He designed us to be active and to be working on behalf of others. Those good works that he created for us. We're going to spend one more week on this next week. Talking a little bit about the, the second half of this. Uh, not just getting ourselves to a place where we're a part of this group. But once we're here, how do we make this a place that others want to be a part of? And then after that, we'll, we'll hit some of our other lessons that we want to get to through the holidays.